Welcome everyone. It's great to see you as part of our Grand Rapids Time Traveler series. My name is Kimberly McKee and I am the director of the Coochie Office of Local History. And I'm really excited about our presentation today titled A Decade of Upheaval, Grand, Rapid, Grand Rapids Women in Public Office in the 1910s. The Coochie Office of Local History is housed in the Brooks College of Interdisciplinary Studies at Grand Valley State University. Our office's mission is to give voice to diverse communities through history. We'll be able to have some question and answer period at the end of today's presentation. Please comment in the Q&A or chat if you have questions for our speaker. Please note that we will not get to all audience questions. Please also note that the webinar is being recorded and will be available online by the beginning of next week at the latest. And you can then find the recording either on our website or on our YouTube channel. I'm pleased to introduce Joellen Clary, our speaker for today. By profession, a literary scholar, Clary has redirected her path into the world of local women's history in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where she has been dedicated to crediting early area women as community builders. For the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council, she works to advance long-term projects highlighting the roles of local women in, Michigan's, in the Michigan suffrage movement, to oversee a complete electoral history of the city's women, and to organize research on US women's immense but little known work during World War I. She has also served as a director of the Grand Rapids Historical Society, the Grand Rapids Historical Commission, and as liaison to the Michigan Women's Studies Association, whose statewide conference she has chaired. I hope you join me giving a warm welcome to Joellen. I'm very excited to have her with us today. Um, I She's, as so many of you know, have made such great contributions to local women's history. Welcome, Joellen. Thank you, thank you, Kim. I'm delighted to be here. And I send greetings from my screen to yours and wishes for a future in person. So I'm very happy to be able to share with everyone today virtually as we take a look back at a heady decade when Grand Rapids women stepped onto public stages in increasing numbers. Women had long participated in civic affairs and could even run for elective office before the 19th Amendment took effect in 1920. But suddenly in Michigan, after November 1918, the state's women could run for anything, and they did. During the 1910s, which began in peace and prosperity, but ended in war and pandemic, Grand Rapids women sophisticated their political game, claimed party affiliations, and carried their visions and concerns into public office. Um, here we go. The Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council has for over 30 years recruited and trained researchers to celebrate the early accomplishments of female scientists, architects, factory girls, journalists, and even reformed courtesans. Today, however, we will focus on women as politicians and celebrate our most recent large web project. Our new web page, Women Who Ran, seeks to ensure that we recognize the long electoral history of Grand Rapids women, as well as the political continuity in American women's history. Women fighting for public office today stand on shoulders that have been there with us from the beginning of the Republic. And when the Women's History Council digs out local women's forgotten histories and credits them as the community builders they were, we also prove the significance of local history to national narratives, especially when we're talking about the large movements like suffrage and women's electoral history. The first installment of our new web page is fully searchable, alphabetically, chronologically, for now in the first installment from 1887 through 1920, but by city, state, and national office, occupation, marital status, reform activism, and party affiliation. So today I have to pick and choose what to talk about even within the 1910s. But be sure to raise a question later about anything I ignore. And please take a look yourself later at ggrwhc.org 
That's the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council's initials.org. Individual pages featuring candidates have biographical information. Um, some is skimpy. As genealogists know, women are very often hard to find historically, but we have the images that we've been able to find, um, especially difficult until the later years, and some of them have, have had to be pulled from newspaper microfilm. Um, these pages include campaign information and reference lists as well. So American women couldn't just get up one day and start running for office. Last year's celebration of the centennial of the 19th Amendment reminded us that 70 years of focused effort went into ensuring voting rights. And today we are celebrating 47 different women who ran 82 campaigns between 1887 and 1920. At the end of that push for suffrage, but before they could actually benefit from the 19th Amendment. I can just touch on their story today about how complicated Michigan's women's electoral history really is. The story begins with school suffrage in 1867, when a state constitutional convention enabled cities to allow their women to vote on school issues. That, by the way, generally meant that they could also run. And you can see here that the National Suffrage Journal Revolution announces that the women of Sturgis, Michigan are attending to meetings. They're paying attention and they were running. During the long dry spells between active suffrage campaigns during the 19th century and into the 20th, women ran for this public office and through school board races, kept the suffrage issue alive for women and in front of male voters. In Grand Rapids, the first woman to win a seat on the school board was one Harriet Cook in 1888. The first Grand Rapids women to run, however, had run the year before, just after the city enfranchised its women in a limited way. This history is specific to individual cities and is complicated. So now, before we proceed further, I also want to acknowledge that this early history figures Grand Rapids white women exclusively up through 1920, but their African-American sisters were also leading political lives we should never forget. Even before the Civil War, freed women worked in intersecting abolitionist and suffragist circles. In 1880, they founded the Colored Woman's Progressive Franchise Association. On screen here are three women from Grand Rapids. The older Mary Roberts Tate and Emma Ford were well-connected both statewide and nationally in temperance and anti-Jim Crow circles. And Ethel Beverly Burgess was instrumental in founding local organizations that fed the later NAACP and Urban League. They all acted from within a tiny African-American population in Grand Rapids that did not exceed a thousand people until around 1920. Existing organizations in those days were generally segregated, but we cannot forget the continuing presence of African-American women in both civic reform and suffrage circles. The women of the city knew each other and occasionally black and white women supported each other and um, organized events together. On the right here is Lucy Thurman, whose national career began in Jackson, Michigan with the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, as well as the National Association of Colored Women. And on her coattails rode Grand Rapids African-American women who became well-known in their own right. They were all supporters of women's suffrage. And on the left here is Grand Rapids Mary Roberts Tate, a national lecturer who spoke locally at a memorial program at the prestigious Ladies Literary Club in Grand Rapids after the death of Susan B. Anthony. You can see her name on the program in the lower left. The electoral history of local African-American women doesn't begin until 1951, but then it grew steadily as sentiment for a second wave feminist um, movement inspired all women to throw their hats in the ring. 
once again after a long dry spell during the 20th century. Now from this overview, we will look back at first wave feminism in its culminating decade when women exploded into the electoral arena. The 1910s <laughs> exploded generally, not only electorally. Public issues became more intense as recent influxes of immigrant labor fueled local factories and faced conditions ripe for labor unrest. And war in Europe loomed until it broke out and dragged in the United States in 1917. Through it all, women candidates for office benefited from a reawakened suffrage movement after a period often dubbed the long slog. But 27 different women ran for office during the decade of the 1910s. Not only had American women suffered decades of rejected petitions and referenda, in Michigan, the Constitutional Convention of 1907 had revoked the right of non-voters even to submit petitions for referenda. It took women running for office and the suffrage movement a while to pivot toward other forms of, of cage rattling. But Grand Rapids women since 1887 had steadily been running for school board in increasing numbers. And in 1910, they had new energy. Nationally, the suffrage movement had been re-energized by some wins and Grand Rapids women restructured their own suffrage movement and hit the streets as this slide testifies. Behind this float, 75 suffragists followed in bunting laden cars in one of the earliest parades in US history. Then in 1912, a suffrage referendum put to the state's male voters nearly passed statewide. Some claim that it, fraud was um, re responsible for the failure. And in 1914, inspired and energetic local women actually took over the Grand Rapids Press as part of a day of in-your-face activities in May. They had graphics, cartoons, automotive reports about women's buying habits and driving capabilities, and a weather report. A perfect day to vote for suffrage, you won't be surprised. Women in the 1910s generally leapt ahead in their creative use of print media. Here appearing in a Detroit newspaper is Aldi Louise Tuck Blake and her four suffragist daughters. This African, or excuse me, this Grand Rapids woman's face became familiar through the newspapers and hers is a name you will hear again today. And from the Coochie office, which was founded by Blake's grandson, Paul Coochie. Still, all along, women had kept running in school board races to the point where in the 1910s, they could risk arguing points of policy among themselves. Over the years, the races had not been dull. A textbook ward, fraudulent ward nominations, and PTA attacks on czar-like principles, principles figured in the history. But in 1911, well-known physician Emma Nichols Wanty and her opponent, Christian scientist Agnes Chalmers, made it clear that while their stances differed on the contentious question of medical inspections in schools, they were allied in the larger fight. The community altercation over this issue wasn't as simple or as civil, however, and scandal struck. On election morning in 1911, both city newspapers ran a political ad purportedly quoting Agnes Chalmers. If I am elected, I shall certainly take my religion into the school with me. During the day, Chalmers identified her saboteurs as prominent city citizens, John W. Blodgett and Justina Hollister. She had sparred with the latter at an Opportunity Club event. From 7 p.m. until midnight, election night, Chalmers met with her editor of the Grand Rapids Herald and Blodgett's attorney. They finally agreed that a confession be printed in the next day's paper. You can see that on the lower right here. Blodgett seems to have gotten off lightly saying that he was misinformed, but Chalmers did win her seat, as did Wanty. They were both elected. And Chalmers 
got the last and fullest word in a long article which she published in a national magazine. This is subheaded, political doctors admitted the selfish motive and their allies confessed to forgery. Even though for years, women had been able to run only for school board and then a little bit for library commission in the 20th century, it was not all dull. During the very same month in April, 1911, 6,000 workers walked off the job in the famous Grand Rapids furniture strike over poor wages, long hours, and exploitative working conditions. When furniture manufacturers employing about one third of the city's workforce brought in strike breakers, even women with babes in arms participated in street fights. The strike was the longest and most violent in Grand Rapids history and it transformed city politics, something negatively, and had a lasting effect on women's electoral history. In the wake of the strike, seven women identified as socialists and stepped onto another public stage by running for school board positions. They gave another face to socialists. Well before the Red Scare of 1917, socialists were perceived as a threat to vested interests. In every case, these seven women were consistently dubbed socialists in the newspapers. And as you can guess, they ran very poorly in their elections. We have photographs of only two of them. One of them on the left, Sarah Hagel, in 1910 formed the Grand Rapids Equal Opportunity Club for the mutual improvement of its members. This was associated with the Socialist Party and it hoped to reach women not affiliated with local club wife otherwise. Virtually all of the socialist women who ran for office were members of this organization. And Mary Hay on your right was publicly supported by the Grand Rapids Socialist Party whose treasurer she was. Hay was a speaker at an event dedicated to contemporary women's issues, but her primary strategy running for office was as the mother of eight children. Someone, at least the newspaper said, eligible to say a word or two concerning children's education. Now we have sampled a moment of individual excitement in the Chalmers case and the longer lasting effect on women's electoral history made by the 1911 strike. But when the great war shook the nation, it was not lost on women that the moment could be of utmost significance to them and further their political and personal goals. Within weeks of US entry in April, 1917, 17,000 women's committees sprang up nationwide, enabled in part by suffrage, organizational and communication structures. For decades, women's reform movement efforts had coexisted with suffrage efforts and then suddenly they had a federal mandate for the civic projects that they had been carrying from the 19th century and women hit the ground running. When suddenly in Michigan, the final suffrage push occurred when in the spring of 1918, the legislature just up and announced that, for, that a referendum would be held six months later, women had to move. By Labor Day in 1918, their soldier sons were demonstrating on their behalf for the full rights of citizenship. And despite war work carried on during the major pandemic of 1918, Michigan suffragists rallied public support and educated the public and politicians on their mammoth accomplishments. The male voters of Michigan were finally convinced to fully enfranchise their women and the national suffrage map illustrates that with Michigan, suffragists had made a huge inroad into the Midwest. Take just a quick second to look at this map. It's really interesting. People think that the East Coast led um, politically very often, but it was really the wild and woolly states in the West. And um, the, the Midwest was the proving ground. Once there were footholds in the Midwest, the country would go. Now, 
within itself, the Michigan women, win open doors to new rights and privileges. Now women could run for any public office they chose, and they did. Full suffrage meant that if you could vote for it, you could usually run for it, and women did. Although no city races were partisan the first year in 1919, legislative races were in the offing and women began committing themselves to party politics and got ready to wade into those state level races and their overt partisan politics. Notice here that by 1920, only four women running for office had identified themselves as Republicans or as Democrats, not as many as the proclaimed socialists. One notable socialist woman made her first run in 1919 and became of one of two women firsts in city races for office that had previously been out of bounds for them. Since we do not have photos of their major players, let this image of the Women's Label League Journal stand for those socialist women who remained active after the flurry of earlier school board races. So far, we know very little about Violet Blumenberg, except that when she stepped up, she took a large step. In 1919, in her race for city comptroller, she was the only candidate brave enough to face off against the incumbent. Of course, she lost, but she can illustrate for us that in 1919, women always ran against high odds in these races. And not just because they could did they run, but they ran to establish models for women coming after them and sometimes to keep lesser political parties in the mix. Technically, Blumenberg's race was nonpartisan, but the newspapers reported on her run as by a woman socialist, and she certainly did not hide her sympathies. The second woman to set a city record in the new era of 1919 was Etta M. Smith. She became the first woman in city history to compete for the city commission. And today, she offers us a chance to counter much received wisdom about firsts in Grand Rapids women's history. For 60 years after 1961, for example, that would be until now, when Evangeline Lamberts was the first woman actually seated on the Grand Rapids City Commission, it had been assumed that she had also been the first woman to run. Not so. To date, we have found not only Etta M. Smith, who ran in 1919, but Grace Ames Van Hoosen in 1923. These models from first wave feminism were so thoroughly excised from our city histories that women in the 1960s and 70s, second wave feminists, had to blaze all trails afresh. In fact, among the very few positions for which women did not compete before the 1970s are judgeships and the mayor's position. Even though 1919 was an off year for state legislative races, women took on the state campaigns that were on offer, like the University of Michigan Board of Regents and State Superintendent of Public Instruction. Um, you can sort of see on this slide on the screen that five women who ran statewide for state office in 1919, two were for, from Grand Rapids. On a side note, I want to just mention that because the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council is a unique organization, we don't have peer groups who are also building these local histories to provide us a context. But in this document, we have another piece of evidence proving that Grand Rapids women's prominent women's suffrage organizations ensured that Grand Rapids women remained in the forefront in the state's early electoral histories. From this ad in the Bay City Times alone, we know that Etta Comstock Boltwood, number three, was one of the first two women running for positions on the University of Michigan Board of Regents. The ad points out at the bottom that there were eight regents running a leading co-educational university and that at least two of them should be well-qualified women. Boltwood's ad used when she ran again in 1927 makes the same point. 2,000 girls in the University of Michigan need a woman regent 
The point was taken two years later and the woman finally won. I'm sorry, I forgot to give you that. So this was from her um, 1927 run. She lost both times, but as I said, um, she was visible and two years later, a woman ran. At the very top of the Bay City ad was placed Grand Rapids Mary Hinsdale, the first woman ever to run in the first year any woman could run for Michigan Superintendent of Public Instruction. The sheet notes that there is but one state superintendent over 86% of teachers in the state who were women. Hinsdale is also given exclusive space for a platform argument and the greatest overall space in the ad. She had pursued graduate education at Radcliffe College and earned a PhD in 1912 from the University of Michigan. But clearly women in 1919 and again in 1921 felt this position could be won by this particular woman. I have to tell you though, that to date, the closest a woman has come was in 2018, when a woman was appointed acting superintendent after a death. Among Hinsdale's many achievements, her authoritative book on the presidential cabinet remains her lasting legacy. The next year, in 1920, we have the first big election year when Michigan women could even run for national office, and one did, and for the state house, and they did. First up is once again, the amazing Etta M. Smith. When she had first run for city commission in 1919, Smith emerged as quite probably the Grand Rapids woman most experienced in partisan politics. But her obituary writer in 1952 failed to mention politics at all. In February 1919, Smith had won distinction as the first woman ever to preside over a political convention in Michigan when she was elected permanent chair of the Kent County Democrats. Then a few days later, she was the surprise of the day when she filed a petition as the first woman ever to run for a seat on the Grand Rapids City Commission. Just a year later, in the first state election open to women, Smith ran as a Democrat for a seat in the Michigan legislature. Clearly, she didn't come out of nowhere. Her obituary, obituary writer did recognize her decades of service to the Michigan Rebecca Assembly, the women's branch of the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, an early mutual support society um, begun prior to governmental safety nets. nets. As a longtime officer for both the local and state level Rebecca's, Smith had gained the leadership, speaking, publicity, publicity, knowledge of issues, and organizational skills that underwrote her political campaigns. Had she won, not only would she have become the first woman seated on the city commission, she would have become the first woman to serve as the state representative in Michigan. As it is, she remains one of the first two women to run for the Michigan State House. This is impressive in part because Smith was not conventionally connected as were the large majority of women seeking office in those days, aside from the socialists. Many of those women had experience in the suffrage movement, on city committees, and in prestigious women's clubs. And these women have been easier to find in the historical record. But our new electoral history has lifted the veil on another category of women with burning interests in policy issues and interests in pursuing public office. Now, the other Grand Rapids woman running for state representative in 1920 is our LD Louise Tuck Blake. She threw her hat in the ring for the state legislature as a Republican, and it was among the early women brazen enough to run ads in newspapers. You can also see here um, that she figured in party politics when she stood up against Republican party boss, Frank McKay. Aldi Blake described herself as preeminently a home woman, but her civic life in Grand Rapids illustrates that she claimed and practiced her rights as an American citizen in every way open to unenfranchised women at the turn of the 20th century. New to Grand Rapids in the 1890s, Blake was soon on her way to holding offices in the prestigious Ladies Literary Club and the Consumers League. After Blake won a seat 
on the Grand Rapids School Board in 19, or I'm sorry, 1899. She ran for city offices three more times, but her main investment was in city and state suffrage movements, where she became an extremely important fixture during the 1910s. After years of work resulted in suffrage success in 1918, Blake exercised her new rights by entering politics, electoral politics once again in 1920, when she ran for the Michigan State House. She did not win, but she put up a fight. And then Blake was appointed to the Republican State Central Committee when Michigan women were suddenly valuable to political parties. Unafraid to make waves, she was engaged in well-politicized struggles against the state political machine and removed then, as you can see, for bucking party boss, Frank McKay. Blake's political life continued in the Michigan League of Women Voters, which she served as its first treasurer. Both Blake and Smith lost their state races for representative in 1920, respectively as a Republican and as a Democrat. But another Grand Rapids woman, Eva McCall Hamilton, did become the first Michigan woman ever to be seated in the Michigan legislature. In fact, in the state Senate. Remember that all three women were able to run their campaigns prior to the August 26, 1920 certification of the 19th Amendment because they had already been enfranchised by the state of Michigan in 1918. They were not dependent on the federal amendment. In Hamilton, we have another woman unafraid to throw words. And she threw herself also into passionate engagements in civic life and politics. Her education had included courses in banking and business, which helped in her fights for fair property rights for married women, the protection of vulnerable widows and retired school teachers, for fresh food at affordable prices. When she was appointed by the mayor to the High Cost of Living Commission in 1917, Hamilton helped to establish farmers markets in Grand Rapids and gained a reputation as a powerful speaker, though she suffered derogatory remarks from the aldermen she had whipped. During her one term as Senator, Hamilton saw through about 15 bills and made good use of those courses in banking to promote modern business methods in every department of the state government and to increase teachers' salaries to increase local taxes. Currently, Eva Hamilton's portrait is the only one of a woman hanging in the Michigan Senate chamber. In 1920, she became not only the first Grand Rapids woman to serve in the state legislature, she remained the only for nearly 100 years until in 2018, current Senator Winnie Brinks won her seat. Don't be fooled today by the anomaly of Michigan's current women at the top of government serving as governor, secretary of state, attorney general, and US senator. Women overall remain woefully underrepresented at almost every level of government. So today we're making a nod toward 47 different Grand Rapids women who ran 82 campaigns for office before the 19th Amendment became the law of the land. Certified on August 26, 1920, it reads, the right of citizens to the United States, of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of sex. Alas, that the amendment is not perfect. It refers only to sex. It does not prohibit literacy text, tests and the like, and we continue to fight voter suppression and new manifestations today. And we continue to fight for an equal rights amendment for women for constitutional protection overall. The idea started in 1921, a hundred years ago. And the first formal proposal was put forward in 1923. Back in 1920, when the suffrage movement rolled itself over into the League of Women Voters, there were still burning issues to be addressed. Today, the League maintains its educational and citizenship goals. Our city unfortunately lost its branch in the 1990s, though the state group began its proud history in Grand Rapids and with some of our women serving as officers. There's now a new Grand Rapids branch functioning under the Kalamazoo branch and I wish them well. 
Among the early leaders in the league was Grace Ames Van Hoosen, who's, whom you can see second from the left in this 1920s photo. With her, we can take a peek into the future of women's electoral histories beyond 1920. Because the women who ran webpage includes the later histories, now at this point, only of individual women who ran first before 1920. Um, okay, so it goes up to 1920, but if a woman had run before 1920, we include her later runs. Um, so with the example of Grace Ames and Husen, who had run for school board, city commission, et cetera, um, before 1920, we can see on our website that we have discussed only city, state, and national runs for office. We haven't mentioned the county. In fact, in 1930, Van Hoosen not only ran for the Kent County Board of Supervisors, she won and served through 1938 during the depression with a large all male board. There were nearly 40 members. There's Grace in her hat. Um, there's a, we have a long photograph that shows all of them. Her win was also unknown in the 1970s when for the first time again, women ran for county commission. So as far as we know, no other city in the United States has a comprehensive electoral history. We have documented nearly 1,000 campaigns at this stage of our work. Now that obviously goes beyond 1920, but because of limited resources, we have not even been able to extend our project throughout Kent County. So we can only imagine what other surprises remain to be discovered in the area. But finally, Let's tip our hats, not only to the winners from the past, but to all of the women who risked losing. The odds were high that they would, but how very many there were who also ran. I want to tell you that on next Wednesday, March 31st, in a broader program featuring women who ran, I will look both before and after the 1910s and rehearse a little more fully the long road to this web page. But I want to mention some of the main players now. 20 years ago, former city clerk Sandra Wright and I started this project. Before there was anything up on the internet, we got plenty of bloody fingers sifting through paper files. It languished for a while. Um, but during that time, Yvonne Sims helped look at our original spreadsheet that went up until 1999, 2000, pulling out African-American women, um, some of whose names we didn't know um, because we didn't know, we didn't know the broader community. Then in 19, or in 2016, 17, Angela Chen, an intern from Calvin College, took on the daunting task of filling in the early years. School board races were not handled by the city until 1906. And Sandy Wright and I just had not gotten back to doing that onerous work. Much of which had to be done with newspapers because the records in the school board of the school board just listed winners. So Angela Chin gets a great big nod here. More recently, Alyssa Notch, an intern from Aquinas has worked in the 1920s. And soon Gabe Legrand from Calvin will be working in the 1930s. So you can see their work up relatively soon. The main force, however, behind this webpage is board member Julia Baucamp, who has now started a graduate program in Delaware, or she would be here today. Not only did Julia refine past work up until 1920, she did the fuller research and writing on the individual women that you'll find on the web page, and she created the page itself. I thank her and all of her precursors. I thank the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council for its sponsorship, and I thank all of you for being here today. Thank you. Joellen, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Um, as a reminder to folks, if you joined us a couple minutes late, uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website and our YouTube channel by the beginning of next week. Um, so again, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. I feel like I learned so much each and every time I hear you talk about and discuss uh, women's um, participation in electoral politics in not only just Grand Rapids, but Michigan more broadly.
Um, and so just as a reminder for folks, if you do have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or in the Q&A to us. Uh, but I do have some questions of my own. And so you touched upon this briefly at the end just now, describing the process of sort of how this women who ran website came to be. And I really appreciate that. Um, can you say a little bit more about the kinds of sources that folks were using to gather this, gather uh, materials and information about these women? Yes, um, everything. <laughs> Julia's search in the last few years has been very different than what Sandy and I were doing initially. It took us a lot of time going around to um, Lansing, um, the clerk's offices in the city of Grand Rapids and at the county and hifting great gigantic leather tomes onto copy machines um, to get the rough materials, the primary materials that we were using and that made up our first, our first effort. However, we, we ran into a lot of cases where women were identified only by their initials. And so we had to go to city directories we had to look in any, all, any sources that the Grand Rapids Archive had, um, absolutely anything that we could think of to try to identify exactly who um, AS someone was. And in fact, there were Beverly's who turned out to be men, Anne's, A-N-N-E, which turns out Anna or something to be a Dutch male name as well. And so we, um, when we were just trying to document who was a woman and who wasn't, it took us to many other sources. Um, and I want, to, I want to note again, I mentioned it, but I want to note again just how generally difficult it is doing, doing women's history. Um, if I mentioned genealogists who always know that following mothers into the past um, is often failing. And it's still shocking to me that women's history as a discipline really only began in the 1970s, around 50 years ago. So we don't have second, many secondary materials that we can use. Um, in fact, this we put the Women's History Council put up a digital suffrage exhibit last year, getting a lot of information onto our website and this web page, the electoral history web page this year. We've so far gotten up nothing on all of our World War I work. We're a volunteer organization, and so we're not helping the cause. We need to we need to up our game and get some of this research out there so that these women can be discovered more fully online and more successfully than we were able to to find them. Um, but the work that we've done shows that what we've already known, that women's political, social, religious, and economic histories are not the same as men's. So you're not going to find them in the same places. Julie Taber from the Grand Rapids Library has done some great um, programming on finding women in resources where you wouldn't think to find them, like in a Burkean gay factory newsletter, where it listed every, all the women's birthdays by the month, and, the, and that kind of thing. So yes, looking absolutely everywhere and anywhere for information that intersects with local history has been help, helpful. And there's a lot of creative searching that's been going on because women's records themselves were not considered important enough to save. That's why we are so lucky that we have 23,000 World War I women's registration cards that lived in the attic of the library for most of the 20th century. But we have, but for example, we do not have, this is just heartbreaking. We don't have even suffrage organizations citywide or statewide for minutes or correspondence. Everything we found occurs in private collections. Well, I think your comments really reflect on the importance of what a lot of folks call reading the archives against the grain, right? So thinking about where mm -hmm. the silences and the gaps are and where we can yes. find women sort of being hidden within these histories, especially because um, other archives outside of private correspondence may not necessarily have um, this kind of information. And so given um, your work also thinking about documenting gender and that sort of thing, um, thinking about too what you just said in terms of um, how names that we might traditionally view as sort of women's names or more feminine sounding names mm -hmm. were actually men. Um, I'm also curious, though, to take this conversation into a different direction. Was there anything unique about Grand Rapids at the time in terms of thinking about uh, women running for office in comparison to women sort of running for office across the state or even the nation? 
Well, that's I, I alluded to that briefly in that we just don't have peers. Um, I didn't mention uh, a crowdsourcing site that started five or six years ago called Her Hat Was in the Ring. That's what really gave us the kick. And when I found Angela Chen to help us start documenting more fully the women who had run before 1920. The, clearly, clearly, the founders of Her Hat Was in the Ring had some grant money. And they spent a lot over a summer paying some people to really search online what they could find that cities have put up. And for example, a few years ago, when I was fleshing out the county commission women up through like 2011 or through 2012, I found that they had just started hosting some of their runs, but they hadn't historically. Um, oh man, I just, my brain just went out the window. Well, I, while you're collecting your thought, what, um, <laughs> you know, I, I really appreciate it because you did present with Julia to the Coochie office community uh, a mm -hmm. few years ago about her hat was in the ring. And I, I dropped oh, that yeah. link into the chat. And if you are watching this recorded webinar, you can find that link in the description right. of uh, the recording. But Thanks. I, but I think too, um, you know, thinking about sort of how I think the greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council is very unique. I mean, at the start of our um, roundtable this month, as you know, we were uh, doing an all digital virtual roundtable similar to sort of this series as well due to COVID-19. But Liat Gidlow, his, the historian Liat Gidlow, who was on our first um, sort of panel session, really highlighted the fact that the Greater Grand Rapids, Rapids Women's History Council was such a um, helpful source as she was working on her books regarding sort of women's um, engagement mm -hmm. um, in electoral politics. But then, so given sort of the work that you have done and you continue to do, um, I'm wondering if um, you could say a little bit more about, is there something sort of about American culture, broadly speaking, um, that might have impacted sort of women's um, successes or maybe even their barriers to um, running for elected office. Um, this is a question from one of our audience members. So they think they're putting this into sort of a broader context of thinking about um, women running for president, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, we recognize that Kamala Harris broke new ground as our first female vice president, but also thinking too about women who had run for, um, for president to be sort of the lead on the democratic ticket obviously for 2020, but also then thinking about Clinton in 2016. Um, and so this question is rooted in thinking about how other countries have women heads of government. You know, do you think there's something like what, do you, do you have any thoughts about this? <sighs> um, Kamala Harris didn't come from nowhere. Hillary Clinton didn't come from nowhere. Um, women have been at it forever. So it has sometimes seemed to me almost a fluke that say 2018 was dubbed the year of the woman, women. Um, another, what was it, 1990 was a big year. Um, it's some of it I think is responding to topical events and pressures. Um, it's still unpredictable, but women have just really kept the pressure on, have kept, have kept it up. Right, as I mentioned, from the beginning of the Republic. I mean, we all know the famous letters from Abigail Adams to her husband, John, talking about politics. And we sometimes think it's a real mistaken assumption that women's political lives did not begin until 1920, when the 19th Amendment was passed. Um, even as non-voting citizens, they were lobbying, they were petitioning and that kind of thing. Um, so the environment is, gets booster shots sometimes. I mentioned in 1910, the suffrage movement had been in the doldrums and there was a win nationally. There was a re-energizing of the national movement and that had ripple effects locally. On the other hand, when Michigan men enfranchised the women in November of 1918, that had ripple effects going in the other direction. Suddenly there was this model from, model from the Midwest. And so until, until we have just a whole lot more data it's really hard to analyze that. And that's what we were talking about when my brain went out the window about context, where her hat, for example, put up 3,000 some women who had run nationwide before the 1920 amendment would have affected their races. They still, they haven't pushed that ahead. 
we are in the process now of starting to send them um, data on our women up to 1920, but that it's, it's not that useful because where we have been scrupulous in our research, they've been beholden to whatever they found on websites, whether it's accurate or not. But the biggest thing is that we need a lot more studies like our own from local areas um, within Michigan, all over the United States. I can tell you that Grand Rapids has always been <laughs> throughout its history, um, a relatively significant mid-sized city in the Midwest. So that um, West Michigan women were kind of a bellwether. Um, we know that West, that Grand Rapids women in particular, because of the way that Michigan history has been done, have not been credited until recently as being suffrage leaders. It was always assumed that Detroit ran the state. And in fact, no, <laughs> the, the Southeast Michigan and the suffrage movement was, re was retrograde to some extent. And in 1900, the major Grand Rapids leaders were tutoring, were tutoring them. So we don't know these things until the work gets on the local level. And work on the local level can be done by an academic historian as well, like Liette Gidlow when she was writing her book on getting out the vote movements in the 1920s, and she foregrounds the um, League of Women Voters from Grand Rapids. So um, I can make guesses. My guesses might be a little more informed than certain other people about um, the legacy of Grand Rapids, the cultural moment today, but um, I think we just don't know enough yet. No, I, I think this is really helpful. Uh, we have time for about maybe, I think, on one other question, and we'll see if we have time for another one. This comes from an audience member. Mm -hmm. um, do, what have you found in terms of women's family members so thinking about spouses, children, their parents, um, supporting their efforts to run for electoral office? In particular, um, last year, um, when we were shut down, about two weeks after the shutdown, the Kuchi office was going was supposed to sponsor an event on Aldi um, Blake, and two of the speakers would have been her descendants, Moana Kuchi and Bob McArdle, and they have been working um, to complete work started by Blake's grandson, Paul Kuchi, on the family history and how much her family was actually involved in supporting her, um, not just from helping run the household when she was busy being the treasurer of the state, et cetera, but um, to the extent of an uncle, I believe, helping the Blakes buy a home when they were first in Grand Rapids and putting it in her name so that she could be, a, she was a property owner and she could vote. Earlier than that, in the first generation of women suffragists in Grand Rapids, um, some women were su suffragists just weren't out even to their husbands. Um, so there wasn't support there. However, the biggest woman, Emily Burton Ketchum in the 19th century would be lobbying in Lansing and make the fashion pages. She was in, dressed in rose, fish, you know, rose, dusky rose with the lace fichu and whatever. But she, her husband and the husband of another woman named Josephine Annafeld Goss made the papers as being supporters and being back home feeding the kids while their wives were in, in Lansing. Um, there, were, there was a lot of publicity about women not being manly men, about suffrage not being a threat to domestic events, so that they put out their families a great deal, and there's quite a lot to be found about that. Well, no, I mean, this is really um, helpful context, and then I, I think we do have time for this one last question, also from an audience member. Um, could you say a little bit more about whether the women who ran in the 1910s tended to fall in a particular direction on other uh, progressive era municipal reforms? Oh, they, um, on, I, I wanted to mention this again because I really didn't get into the data we have on marital status, occupations and professions of all of these women, but it's there and you can sort through it pretty easily right now. Um, they, I'm sorry, Kim, I need another cup of coffee. The question? Sure. Um, could you talk a little bit more about whether the women who ran in the 1910s tended to fall in a particular oh, yes. direction? Oh, yes, 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 yes. There's okay. another category called reform, reform movements, efforts, and they're listed by women also. Now, that's crude because we could only put in what we found in newspaper articles or organizational journals and that kind of thing. But in a nutshell, everything that um, we care about today maybe in slightly different ways, but they cared about then. 
children's health, fresh food, all of clean air and water. And women had lots of ideas coming out of Methodist organizations, all kinds of organizations, religious and political, coming out of the 19th century. And as I mentioned, when World War I hit, and the Women's Committee of the Council of National Defense was formed as part of the main National Council of Defense. Women had governmental authority to start moving. Eva McCall Hamilton and other women had failed to get fresh produce into the city through farmers markets until they had a government mandate. And it's no um, accident that the farmers markets bills were passed during World War I. So they were involved. If you were a suffragist, you were an anti-child labor. Um, advocate for the most part. Um, there were anti-suffragists and there were splits among women. I illustrated just one of them regarding um, religion and a medical issue, but virtually all of these activist women were active in other arenas as well and affected what came later. <laughs> well, thank you so much for such a robust presentation. Um, I just want to remind folks that, that this uh, webinar was recorded it will be posted on our website and YouTube channel by the beginning of next week. Um, and again, thank you, Joellen, for lending your expertise with us for this last hour. Um, I just want to remind folks that the next installment of our Grand Rapids Time Traveler series will be on Friday, April 30th from 1030 to 1130 AM. And it'll feature historian Karen Sieber, who will be sharing her research into the Omnibus College, a traveling experiment in higher education. She'll be discussing um it's local stops in west michigan and the larger great lakes region so thank you so much everybody and you all have a wonderful weekend bye thanks kim